Hello, hello. Good afternoon, Professor Yammerbaum. Oh, good afternoon, Amy. That was amazing. Okay, good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, Jamal. Good afternoon, Sophia. Good, and there's more people. Okay, I'm going to do this very quickly. We have a, a lot. I'm so sad yet happy. Um, and I assume you're happy as yes, good, yeah, yes, exactly. Uh, good, right. Okay, hold on. I'm going to do this very fast. Strangely, we have a lot to do in a weird way. Good afternoon, Jamalet. Good afternoon, Sophia. Good afternoon, Jay Lynn. Good afternoon, Gianna. Top of the afternoon, Abdel. Good morning, Sarah. Good more afternoon, Chloe. Good afternoon, Jasmine. Good afternoon, Diana. I'm coming. Uh, final, yes. Final Oud afternoon. Yes. No, totally right. Stephen. And good afternoon, David. And yes, Stephen. And good afternoon, Brooke. And good afternoon, happy last. Yes, Jada. And good afternoon, Brianna. This is the last. That is totally true. So, of course, I'm totally, you know how I always like don't do anything for the first like 73 minutes of class. And then I try to pack everything and it's the last two minutes. Th that is the micro version of what, and good afternoon, Nicholas. Yes. So like, <laughs> that's what's about to happen here. This is metaphorically the last five minutes of all the classes we've had for two semesters. So it's going to be cray, cray, cray. Not really. I'm not trying to stress you out. I'm excited. I'm, of course, I'm excited for all of you and for us to have a little break. But I'm also very, very sad. And also there's lots of loose ends to tie up. Um, there's no way I'm gonna tie them all up in this period. So let me start again by saying, wait, let me, before, I'm sure I've told you this before. Okay, hold on. In the chat is my email address in case you've never used it in the chat is my uh, cell phone for texting in case you've never used it. Um, I will be in my office, which is 04, well, I can't even remember, but I, I'll be in my office for a couple hours tomorrow on the fourth floor. It's in the syllabus. I can't even remember what it's called. Um, if you want to visit, I, I want to say quickly before we, that you really have been a wonderful class. Honestly, I think you've been incredibly patient, incredibly enthusiastic, incredibly smart incredibly invested and do i say nice things to almost every class every sure i do but i honestly i think um you've been disproportionately wonderful especially considering how like like annoying it is to learn on zoom or how, how hard it is i feel like i really know you very well which is quite a statement for a bunch of people that i largely know electronically i appreciate all the visits and everything i really hope again i want to extend myself in your future if you haven't already looked to me to some sort of support or, or or assistance for future ambitions, please do. I'm happy to support any and all of you, especially those that I know, um, you know, directly. Um, please do come to me with stuff in your future or research or whatever. Um, so don't be a stranger. I'm getting this all out of the way now because as soon as we get rolling, it's going to be over. Um, again, I want to say. Um, like if you're worried about your grade at any point, there's still information coming to many of you. I know that, you know that at any point, reach out. If you're concerned, I, you're probably more concerned than I am, but if you want to check in and make sure you can reach out to me. Um, again, if you've done some real work at some point in this semester, you, you know it in your heart and it will be amply credited. If you know you've never done anything or you've never been here, you know that too, then you probably should reach out to me. Um, logistically, so and we are going to do some physics today. I want to tie up the story of physics. I mean, I want to close the path, so to speak, um, of physics that you've been doing for two semesters. Partly, I want to close it. I want to show you the punchline of all of this. Also, I want to give you something to maybe hopefully lead you to want to take some more physics in your future or read some physics books or see where the story goes from here. Like, so my ultimate, ultimate goal has been for two semesters and is now that you think there is actually something going on in physics that's worth thinking about or something going on in the physical universe. Oh, 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 yes. Okay, great question in the chat. I see that. I see, that's awesome that you noticed that. Thank you for my, yeah, okay, okay. Great question in the chat. I'll get to that in the, in the direct chat. I'm totally psyched that you noticed that. Thank you, one second, direct chat person. Um. So yeah, again, my ultimate goal is for you to sort of like physics or at least find it worthy of attention. Um, the joy 
and, and I really, really do feel, and I hope you see this with me too, I really feel I want you to be all successful as scientists, as professionals in life, as adults, as students. You are, before you ever met me, you were already clearly quite capable of being successful in many ways. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in this class. I just want to remind you one more time, because I think the success is going to work out for most of you in this class and with the grades. We'll get to that in a second. But, it, you know, all professors have their strengths and weaknesses. All students have their strengths and weaknesses. I want to leave you with the message that, that ultimately joy in your work and success in your work are not in contradiction with each other. The more joy you can find in the work, ultimately, that is a path to success. I mean, if I've had any success in my life, it's for that reason. Um, um, and I think that you guys have been a joyful group. And so I think there will be success with the grades. Uh, so, okay, before I forget, someone in the direct chat noticed that you know, a lot of your game turns have been coming out. A lot of your little points are coming back. And then, of course, if you're still missing a midterm, that's going to come back too. But all the points are being added up and collected to give you like one big robust grade. It's all happening slower than it should. But that's why there's forgiveness also with you guys, with stuff that came in slower to me, blah, blah, blah. But yes, on this very last game turn for today, at least one person seems to have already noticed that I actually asked you to give a kind of more robust response. What I really mean by that, you don't have to write a lot. I mean, if you write, like, usually if you write one sentence for the game turn, you write three. I mean, I'm not saying go crazy or anything like that, but I actually am saying that once I get rolling on the physics of today, which I will in a couple of minutes, and once I get rolling, I am going to go fast and it won't, it'll be very lectury in a way. Um, so what I'm asking you to do is like really try to pay attention today. I'm going to, you might've noticed there's a document that you'll have in front of you to help you pay attention. Um, I want, um, so try to get, try to see the big picture of what I talk about today. And in your game turn tonight, it's more, I'm asking you to pay even more attention than usual to the actual physics substance. Um, and if you see what the takeaway is, or you see anything that connects today to anything you've done in physics two months ago or two, or two semesters ago, try to just have that in mind. You don't have to go crazy with the game turn, but just, I guess what I mean is, um, yeah, if you can give me a couple more sentences than usual about what you thought the actual takeaway of today is, that'll help you and it'll help you take the final. I, I, honestly, it's basically really an alert to really try to follow this physics of today. It may strike you as a lot, don't worry about how hard it is to spin it back on a test. Just worry about whether you can like hold it in your mind and um, see where you might want to read books about it later or bring it with you to PCHEM or instrumental or something like that. But yes, as one person in the direct chat noticed, really, if nothing else, I'm giving a lot of extra points to just do today's game turn and just do it on time just so we can all close out like with a solid finish, if you usually write one sentence, try to write three, maybe give a picture, just try to say, I don't, just try to say what you got out of today's material because it summarizes the material for two semesters. But thank you for noticing that person in direct chat. Okay, I'm also gonna say about the final exam, right? Which, which I said would be posted this Thursday, the latest this Thursday, 8 p.m. will be due back Monday night, midnight of next week. And again, I'm going fast. I know I'm going a little crazy. If you have any questions about any of these logistics or any grades or anything, reach out to me personally. Um, but, but, oh, oh, cool, cool. All right. Thank you, direct chat person. Well, that's more points right there for that direct chat person for closing the loop. Thank you. Um, um, yeah. And I guess I, I still feel like I, the direct chat person asked, what do I mean by a robust response to tonight's game turn? I think I really mean extra robust listening and indulging of me that I'm going to be talking 90 miles an hour. Like, I just mean, try to buckle your seatbelts and be patient with this last lecture. Yeah. So thank you for asking and thank you for, okay, closing that loop. As far as the final, you may have already noticed in the, I'm just going to try to clarify quickly now, again, my larger message, if you ever miss anything in any of the YouTubes or any of that, the larger message is I'm rooting for you as much as you're rooting for me. This is not a competition for grades. It's not a competition amongst you. And it's not a competition against me. It's benefit of the doubt to everybody, right? The message is, 
assume that I want you to succeed as much as you want to succeed, but I want you to successfully love physics, right? So just like whatever, if you ever have a doubt about how am I supposed to approach this final exam or what's he going to do about the grade, assume I'm trying to make it work as well for you as, as you are. If you give me something to work with, I will work with that it's, as far as your grades and all. So with the final exam, with the final exam, here's the deal. I think you noticed, and tell me if you didn't, I think, or maybe confirm with electronic signal or something. I think you noticed there's like a practice document in your Google Classroom um, with explanations of what's going to go on. The summary is your actual final exam that will be posted will be 25 true false questions. Like literally, yes, you heard that, like a Google form of like 25 just true false questions. They're simple, they're true or false. They're not easy. Most of them come from the summary of all the material that's coming right now. So you should have that out in front of you to follow what I'm gonna say for the next seven, 60 minutes, okay? I'll get back to that in a second. There's also gonna be one normal everyday physics problem that you'll have to solve. The true false will, pro I can't swear to this, but probably the true false will account for like 75 points of the exam. And the one problem will account for 25 points. I, I might do the points differently. It might be more of a 50-50 breakdown. Don't hold me to that. But you'll have one big problem that you're gonna solve, like a real, you know, physics problem. Either, or and it'll be either a Doppler effect, like compare two cases thing, like we did like a month and a half ago, or it'll be an electric field, add up the field vectors from two point charges, like we did like a few weeks ago, or it'll be like a circuit problem. Eat, all of those are kind of thick. They're kind of like central to everything we've done in the last part of the semester. They're all equally thick, equally sort of computation heavy, but indicative of like the larger conceptual framework of this material. You'll do one of those. Either I'll give you a choice or something, or I, probably I'll give you a choice, but you're going to do one, but be prepared on those. You'll do one problem. It'll probably be your choice. I just have to figure out how to arrange that, but you'll do one problem. You'll do, tw uh, and then the rest will be these true false questions. Now the true false, and then one problem, you know, you've studied, we've had YouTubes on it, blah, blah, blah. Um, You've practiced, we've gone over them. It'll be one very similar to whatever one we've gone over in the um, YouTubes, or if it's a circuit problem, it'd be very similar to what you did in lab. Um, so again, one problem plus a bunch of true false. The true false, I'm gonna turn my attention to in a moment. I will check in with you to make sure I'm not going too fast, but the true false you should have, they won't, your true false will not be identical to the ones that you have in front of you right now, but they'll be, the biggest difference will be that the order will be scrambled up. That'll be the biggest difference. They'll be very similar. Okay, what I'm about to do in two minutes is blast through what I think is like the sum, like the last bits of this material and the summary of all our material. And if you follow along, you'll see those true false. You'll be, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna explicitly refer to them, but a lot of them you'll be able to tick off and find that, like see the answers as I'm going through. And, and I may skip a lot at the beginning. You may already know the ones from the beginning from prior lectures, but once I get to this stuff, I'm more or less going to talk in the order of those true falses. You can use that as like a guide to listen to me in this last class, okay? Then when you get the actual test, the order will be scrambled up. I'm saying that again, just to be clear. But, okay, sorry. Um, but, you know, they're simple. They're not easy. They're, 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 you know, but they're the conceptual conclusion of this course. So, Hopefully you having that in front of you will help you listen to me today. You listening to me today will help you put together the material of the course. Then you'll be able to take that. And weirdly, again, you know, like anything else, it's take home. It's you can talk to each other. I'm not handing out an answer key as such. The answer key is the recording of this lecture. But, you know, um, and again, whichever exam, the midterm or the final you end up having done better on will count more for you. It might even be true that whichever part might even be true that whichever part of the final exam you do better on might even be worth more weight. I'm not sure about that. But again, the, the idea is if you give me something really good somewhere, that will count for a lot in your the math algorithm that is used to calculate your grade. Like it's better to do it's better to triage, do badly in some places over here, but rock somewhere than just do like nothingness everywhere. 
Okay, I'm gonna pause for a second because I see things are in the chat, but in a moment, I'm gonna start this physics, assuming you're all, right, okay, chat, wait. Oh, wait, oh, oh, okay, hold on, hold on. Oh, oh, yeah, no. Oh, wait, you don't, fa hold on, hold on. Oh, okay, wait. Wait, 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 okay, okay, okay. No, I'm glad you're telling me all this in the chat. Oh, you, oh, you can't, oh, you can't see the questions in the forum. Okay, no, no, that that is, uh, okay, no, you're all telling me. That's good. That's um, not on purpose. I'll fix that right now. We will make sure that is not, I don't know why that is. I will fix that right now. I'll try. So you're all telling me, uh, thank you. There's like six people in the direct chat. You're all telling me that actually that final exam is not viewable. Okay, hold on. We will fix that because no, I do want it to be. And again, it's not the actual final, it's practice. And I don't mean for you to hand it in. I don't care if it's not accepting responses. Yes. Because you could just do it on a piece of paper. But yes, you should be able to see it. So hang on, let's fix that. Um, and if you can't see it, yeah, that's definitely a problem. Hold on, hold on. Thank you for taking me. And I will, again, I know I'm talking fast, but I will not start until I'm sure that we're, okay, hold on. Let me see what's going on here. Hold on. Resume click. Oh, okay, okay. I'll fix that. I see. I see what you're saying. That is good. I mean, it's not good, but they don't have to. Accept it. Okay. Now tell me. I think I just fixed it. Um, tell me if you refresh. Hold on, I'm refreshing. I think you should be able to see it now. Uh, tell, I'm gonna look in the chat. It's fixed, great, oh, thank you, okay. That was, okay, great, 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 yes. And thank you all for, you're ta obviously you're hanging in with me. Oh, I mean, hanging, okay. Now, if I can, I'll be sort of looking at it while I'm going to try to discipline me. I, okay, okay, so it works. So again, for anybody who just joined, in a minute, I'm about to blast through the last, you know, punchline of physics, okay? Again, for anybody who's just tuned in, you you should be having that final true-false practice exam in front of you, at least as a guide to how to listen to me or what to listen for. Of course, if at the end I can take questions, I will. But I will warn you again that, like, once we take a breath and we're ready to go, I probably, it'll be hard for me to take questions during it. In fact, I won't. I mean, you, you could put them in the direct chat, but... I may ignore you. You can definitely text me or email me later. It's not about hide the ball. It's just about time management. Um, okay, you can fix it. Okay, okay. So hold on, but I will pull it up too to try to help me. But yeah. Um, okay. And you can see, if you look through, like if you go from the beginning, a lot of the questions at the beginning are sort of from the beginning of the semester. So I'm not necessarily going to address them right now, but the whole point is it's a storyline from the beginning of the semester to the end. What I'm going to get to is the end stuff. The, the more you can see how it all connects, that's the goal. The goal is to see how this all connects, okay? Um, okay, okay. Um, so it's 12.34, so we end it. Okay, oh, wait, there's one more in the chat. You can see, okay. So, okay, let me take one final breath and ask. Are, can I just get a look? Do you basically feel like for all intents and purposes, you kind of know what's about to happen for the next hour and you kind of understand what's going to happen for the next week? Thank you, Gianna. Thank you, Jalen. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you, G Chloe, uh, Stephen. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Abdel. Thank you, Jamal. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Abdel. I uh, got that. Yeah. Okay, great. That's good enough for me. All right. So, okay, I'm gonna switch the view. And obviously this is recorded. You could watch this video too, that would help. And you can help each other, da, 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 da. Okay, here we go. Okay, quick reminder, so here's today, right? Quick reminder and you may, oh, taking notes wouldn't be the worst thing either. No, of course the board stopped. But that equation that you, and you can put your hands down too now. Again, if you do, well, anyway, you get it, okay. The equation that is about to be on the board, boom, that equation, boom, that equation. Please remember back in my, that's from the middle of the semester. That's the wave equation, right? We went through all that harmonic oscillation stuff to and put it all together to build up a collection of staggered oscillators 
which then made a pulse propagating through space. Remember, the whole point of the way of waves and the wave equation was that a wave is a not thingy thing, right? Wave motion means motion of information from here to there. When sound goes from me to you, something must move in order for that to happen. In the particular case of sound, what must move is a bunch of air molecules must move in a very specific harmonically oscillating way. So you can't have sound without the air. The air is a bunch of thingy things, material particles that all oscillate in a very patterned way. But once they do, once they oscillate cosinusoidally in time and space, then we get this entity called sound that moves from my mouth to your ears. And even though it's requiring the collective motion of a bunch of particular air molecules, there is no air molecule that goes from my mouth to your ear when I speak, right? So sound is a thing, but it's not a thingy thing. In other words, in more physics terms, sound is, or waves in general, are raw information propagating through space due to the collective oscillation of actual particles moving in space. When information moves from one point in space to another, no actual particle needs to move from one point in space to another, right? That's the idea of waves. Anything that obeys that second order differential equation is a wave, right? Um, and the second derivative of any one particle along the oscillation axis must be directly proportional to the concavity of the pulse at that point. And the constant of proportionality is the square of the speed at which that raw information, such as sound, propagates through space, right? Okay. Then we move from waves to this next concept of fields, right? Fields came from forces such as gravity, such as electrostatic, any kind of force, any kind of interaction between two thingy things, two particles, any kind of force that doesn't seem to require physical contact between the two objects, right? Again, such as the gravitational force exerted by one point mass on another point mass, or the electrostatic force exerted by one point charge on another point charge is, each of them is an interaction between two material particles that doesn't seem to require any kind of material interaction between the two particles. They communicate somehow actual numbers with each other through empty space. So we start believing in and constructing or believing in and using this concept of a field, which is apparently the raw information describing one particle vis-a-vis -vis another particle, the raw information, the, the, the literal precise numerical information that describes to one point in space where some particle is, how big it is, or where some collection of particles is in space, how big the particles are and how they're arranged, that raw information seems to sit in space by itself, not as matter, as information, and we call that a field. Right? So we've gone from raw information propagating through space, through some particles that are all oscillating, to raw information that's just sitting in space. We call this a field. And one of the constants that I could have written down the gravitational constant too, I probably should have. But the constant that describes the electrostatic field is that E number right there in the middle of the board. Not saying you have to memorize it at all, but I'm saying I'm going to use it today. Okay. So it's there as the electrostatic constant that is equivalent, I should say this, equivalent in the way we use it to the gravitational constant in that it's universal um, uh, and it makes, and it is the universal constant that forces the units to work out when one bit of stuff over here creates a field of information everywhere over there, right? So that first, so capital G works for gravity, that little 
uh, epsilon naught is the number we use for electricity, for electrostatic fields. Again, I'm not saying you have to memorize them, but you have to have perspective, you have to be familiar with them. And then the final number, which I just introduced uh, last class, is the number that is used for so-called magnetic fields. Now, we just introduced magnetic fields last class. I'm well aware. I'm going to remind you of what I mean by magnetic fields today. But magnetic fields are really kind of a subversion of electrostatic fields. I'll remind you of that in a minute. But just know that for each one of these fields that we now care about, these collections of raw information just sitting in space, we have a number associated as a constant of proportionality for that field. Okay. Now, I say magnet, like, let me remind you, electrostatic fields. So from here on in, everything I'm saying is about electricity and magnetism. Electrostatic field is the kind of information, the kind of field that is produced by a point of electrical charge. As long as the charge point exists, electric field exists. Electric fields spread out everywhere symmetrically from points of charge, right? Um, and they spread out in the, as simple and as uniform and symmetric a way as, as, as they possibly can, given the, the symmetry, or the asymmetry, the simplicity, or the level of complexity of one point, the one point that creates them. A point has zero dimensional symmetry, so it creates lines of field that extend with no, with on all axes of space equally. A point has zero dimensional asymmetry, so its field lines pref prefer or label or distinguish no dimension any more than any other dimension. Okay, so they create field like that. But then what we said in the last class is following that idea that the, the, the field picture, the field line uh, diagram from a source is only as complicated or as asymmetric as that source is. Well, we said, what if the source is a bunch of charges moving, flowing in a line? Like this top picture, hold on. This top picture is supposed to be the field lines from a st stationary point of charge. They are called electrical field lines. Below is what we have the field that is created from a flow of charge, or in other words, a current, right? A line of charge that's moving in a particular direction, a current of charge. Well, the most symmetric picture, if you really think about it, the most simple symmetric picture of lines that could extend infinitely from a flow of charge would be field lines that circle, loop, around the line. It's absolutely the simplest way that space over here could know that something is flowing over there. Please again, realize that a flow of charge is like in a way two levels more complicated than a point of charge. One, it's a line rather than a dot, right? It's a line rather than a dot. Second of all, it's a line with direction. It's a vector. It's a one, when I say it, I mean the current, the thing that's causing field now, like we already know charge causes field. No matter if you have any point of charge anywhere, it's going to create field. So what I'm really arguing is if you put a bunch of charges next to each other and then start flowing them along like a river, all of each one of them is going to create the, the field line picture that we have up top. But all those field line pictures are going to interact with each other and reposition each other and re-add to each other. And they have to fall into place into some new pattern, a pattern that's more complicated than that but as simple as it can possibly be and as steady. My argument, if you really think about it, is there's nothing simpler that could convey the fact that we now have a line of charge that is flowing. There's nothing simpler than a bunch of loops going around it. So this situation, this moving, this steadily moving set of electric fields, in effect, is called a magnetic field. Points of charge create electrostatic field, flows of charge, currents, create what we call magnetic field. Now, it's just a name. 
And yes, it's related to like how magnets work and everything, but um, what a magnetic field really is. Magnetic field is to electric field as velocity or, or flow is uh, to a dot. I mean, this is just what happens when you have a bunch of electric fields changing in an unchanging way, kind of like physics 203, right? Now I'm gonna back up and say, look, so these are two symmetric pictures of two different fundamental things that can happen in the world. You can have a point of charge sitting there or you can have a flow of charge. Each one creates a pattern of information, of field lines that's communicating to space exactly what's going on. But notice we're talking about space now. We're, and we're talking about, um, we're talking about space. If you think about it, well, let's go back to that top, that top picture. That top picture of electric field lines is captured by this thing called Gauss's law. We understand that top picture when we think about electrostatic flux. What we say is a point of charge creates field lines, a certain number of field lines that neither get created nor destroyed as they extend infinitely through space. So we say that any closed surface that you put anywhere in space, you put a container anywhere in space, the number of field lines that will bust out of that container is necessarily fully determined by just whatever charge you have contained in the container. Uh, the, the number of field lines going through the boundary, the, the, the two-dimensional boundary of some volume of some three-dimensional space is necessarily term determined by the number of charges found within that space because only points of charge can create field lines. And field lines are only created or destroyed at points of charge. So if you think about it in terms of geometry, what we're saying is what we're saying is the number of field lines coming out the closed two-dimensional region of space known as a surface area is fully determined by the number of charges found within the volume, the three-dimensional space, enclosed by that surface area. We can back up and realize, so we're just saying again something that would be obvious if we were talking about water. The number of water droplets that hits a, the inside of a container is fully determined by the number of water droplets created inside the volume of that container, contained within that container. It's obvious when we're talking about water in space, it's a little bit more abstract that we're now saying field lines work like water in space. But what is it that's obvious about space? What are we presuming? We're actually presuming if you back up and think about it, we're presuming that spaces have boundaries, like a volume, say a volume of an orange is bounded by the skin or the rind of that orange, the surface area of that orange. We're assuming correctly, I'm not trying to trick you, that the, two, the closed area of an orange is the boundary for the three-dimensional volume inside. This idea, which is written here in black at the bottom of the page, works really for any number of dimensions. Like points are zero dimensional. Points are the boundaries for some line segment, right? A line segment is one dimensional. Its boundaries are two points. An open area, like a square, like a piece of paper is two dimensional. Its boundary is a closed path known as a perimeter. Right, the boundary of a piece of paper is like is edge plus edge plus edge plus edge. It's a perimeter measured in meters. Right, a piece of paper is two dimensional. Its boundary is a one dimensional length. Only it's a length that's closed. It's turned into a closed path. The perimeter around a piece of paper is a closed path, a closed one dimension a round trip. Right, a closed one dimensional region of space is the boundary for what you might call an open two-dimensional region of space. And then a closed two, so dots, points, zero-dimensional regions of space are the boundary for a, a, a one, an open one-dimensional region of space, a line segment. 
A close now a line is not the uh, boundary of anything, but if you close it, if you take a line segment and you close it, you make like a ring or a square. Now it is still measured in length, but it's the boundary to a two dimensional area, like a piece of paper, right? And then if you take a piece of paper and you close that up, it's the boundary to a three dimensional region, right? So n dimensional regions of space are bounded by n minus one regions, and generally. The boundary is a closed region, and generally speaking, the the enclosed region is is what we would call open or something, not closed anyway. Okay, so 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 if we look at the laws of physics now that we've established so far, what we're saying is okay. What we're saying is that top one is Gauss's law. It says that the and here comes my board disappearing again for as usual, or maybe not. Yes, of course, of course. Hang on. Hang on. Okay. We're saying that top law we already established is Gauss's law. It says that the that the amount of electric fields at the bound going through the closed surface, bounding some volume of space is fully determined by the charge enclosed within that surface. In other words, you might wanna make a note in your notes, the left side of that top equation is a two dimensional closed surface you can see from the integral symbols. It's a closed 2D region of space it's talking about the boundary. It's talking about how many field lines would bust out of that boundary. And on the right hand side, it's talking about all the charge causing the field. Um, we enclosed within the three-dimensional volume of that space. So it's it's boundary on the two-dimensional boundary on the left, three-dimensional space on the right. Now then we said magnetic field lines, they loop around. See, magnetic field lines are not caused by dots. Magnetic field lines are caused by flow. A flow is not a dot. A flow is a one-dimensional vector, not a zero-dimensional point. So the only symmetric, so flows cause lines to loop around them. Magnetic field lines are themselves closed paths. You follow me? Like electric field lines bust out of closed areas. They radiate out. That's what electric field lines do. Magnetic field lines, again, the things that are caused by flow, they themselves are closed paths already. So, we said yesterday that how Gauss's law would apply to magnetic fields is if you try to look at any container in space, if you're like, oh, I wonder what the magnetic flux, I wonder how many field lines net are fluxing out of this surface. And if we count out as positive and in as negative, if you take any container at all, you might contain some current. There might be some current going through it. So there might be some magnetic field lines coming out of that container. But if they're magnetic field lines looping around some current, they will necessarily loop. They necessarily, by symmetry, just by what field lines have to do in order to be as simple as possible and yet convey to space what's going on, magnetic field lines always loop back onto themselves. Electric field lines never do, magnetic field lines always do. So if you take, so magnetic field lines never create net flux out of any two dimensional boundary, out of any container, because any magnetic field line that busts out of a container which it certainly might, there might be current there, will come back in. So the magnetic flux through any container is always zero. What do magnetic field lines do? Well, look at the third law. Now I'm telling you, I'm just telling you this. If you think about it, the third law says, oh, it's called Ampere's law. It just says mathematically what I'm saying in English. It says, whereas electric field lines flux out of containers, they flux out, they radiate out symmetrically from points, Magnetic field lines don't, they form closed paths. So look at the left side of the third law, it looks just like Gauss's law. It's like an integral of a path. I mean, sorry, it's like an integral of a dot product, right? Which you may look familiar. It looks just like that integral of force dot dx that we were dealing with at the beginning of the semester, right? That work integral, it looks very much like it. So much so that now it's a one dimensional integral. The left side of the magnetic law says mag magnetic fields don't flux out. They loop around. They form closed one-dimensional regions of space. And what are they determined by? They're determined by the current 
enclosed within. What do I mean by enclosed within? I mean, remember now, just like a closed two-dimensional region of space is the boundary for any three-dimensional region, and that's what Gauss's law on the top there is talking about for electricity with magnetism, go to the next lower dimension. A closed path is the boundary for an open area enclosed within. So the magnetic law that I'm asserting to you, I'm asserting for the first time right now, but I'm asserting that it makes sense once you see this pattern, once you accept that field lines are as patterned and as simple as they could be, once you get the concept of fields, I'm saying there's this law called Ampere's law, which is like the direct analogy to Gauss's law. It's what we would have to believe about magnetism if magnetism is just our name for what fields do when they come from flowing charges from currents. With magnetism, what we say is, okay, picture any closed path in space, like a circle, for example, a circle. It is the boundary to some disk within. Whatever amount of current is fluxing, flowing perpendicular to the circle, the disk enclosed within the one dimensional closed path, whatever current is fluxing through, flowing through the, the open two dimensional area bound by some path that you're looking at, that current will create the full amount of magnetic field going around that path. The closed path integral of magnetic field is around the closed path integral, like from the beginning of the semester, the closed, the sum, the full total amount of magnetic field that you find when you walk through any closed path is fully determined by the current fluxing through the area enclosed within your closed path, right? So magnetic field is determined, like magnetic field is determined by current, just like electric field is determined by charge. Only with electric field, it's a two-dimensional to three-dimensional statement. And with magnetic field, it's a one-dimensional to two-dimensional statement. Let that sink in. This is the kind of thing where direct chat person asks, like when I say like, do a robust game tour tonight. I just mean like, listen to me very robustly now, if you can. I know I'm saying a lot. Let it sink in. Let yourself think about it and debate with other people tonight when you do your game tour or whatever. Just try to make, you know, I'm just saying. It's a lot, but it it's a concept. It's not numbers. The concept is closed one-dimensional region of space bounds open two-dimensional region of space, closed two-dimensional region of space, bounds three-dimensional region of space. Gauss's law says electricity busts out of containers the way magnetism loops around areas, okay? That's the, now that's the three laws right there. That's the top three law, like the three equations on this sheet, two of which we said last week, one of which I'm saying right now, or last month, yeah, last week, one of which I'm saying right now, please note that there's a pattern to the left side of these equations, okay? Now, I'm gonna, so the top two are called Gauss's law for electricity and Gauss's law for magnetism. The next one's called, the one I just said is called Ampere's law for magnetism. Now, hopefully, again, you're seeing sort of a pattern here, like, like dots create lines of flow create. Um, but then it turns out there's a law called Faraday's law, which actually all of you have seen in one form or another, maybe in seventh grade. I mean, you didn't see it in this mathematical expression, but you're all aware of Faraday's law. It's called sometimes called Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. Okay. Um, and it came a little bit later than these other laws. And, you know, by the way, I'm writing all these laws in sort of integral form with, uh, you know, vectors and everything to put it in the language that we have in this class. When each one of these laws came out at its time, in its day, all in the 1800s, yeah, in the 1800s, they weren't all written, they weren't written as a package. It was different people coming up with these different laws, different results in different labs. But the last one came up, uh, was come up, um, was developed by Michael Faraday, who's a high school chemistry teacher in Scotland. He realized 
he realized, now I'm going to ask you to look at the right side of the last equation. Look at the right, we're going to read it right to left on purpose. He realized that if you had an area, if you had an area, see the double integral on the right side, it, now it doesn't have a circle on it. That's not a mistake. Just notice that double, a, double integral on the right side of the last equation. He noticed that if you look at an area and you look at the magnetic flux going through that area, so, you have, so on the lab table, for example, you create a big magnet like above and below the lab table. So you have this big amount, a big number of magnetic field lines like coming up from the table, for example. Um, maybe because you did a huge, well, you know, coil of wire going like this. So it create all, you know, up to down. So it made with it. So you're within the axis of this huge coil of wire of, of current carrying wire. So you've got this magnetic field that's pumping through the table. He found out something that was logical and sort of predicted at first, but then became a much bigger result than was expected. He found out that if the magnetic field through an area, so the magnetic flux through an air, an open two-dimensional region of space, if the magnetic flux itself changed in time, notice the DDT before the integral, right? If you change the magnetic flux through an area, if either over time, you either made the magnetic field strength through the area stronger or weaker, or you made the area itself bigger or smaller through time, then, then in the closed path, bounding that area in the sort of circle around that area or the square around that area, whatever closed path around that area, all of a sudden there would be electric field. There would be an electric field through the closed path circling the open area through which you changed magnetic field. He found this out. It was a, it tur turns out no matter how he did it, whether he changed the magnetic field strength or he changed the size of the area or both. Then if there was more or less magnetic field lines being pumped through an, an open two dimensional region of space, then in the closed one dimensional region, the perimeter of that space, we would get a electric field through that path. Now, what you may remember from earlier in the semester and earlier and earlier, the left side, whoops, sorry, that left side that I just, hello, that left side, the integral of, the path integral of force times displacement, the path integral of force times displacement is known as work, remember? And work leads to transfer of energy. The closed path integral of force times displacement, you might remember from earlier in the semester, is called conservative work. It leads to potential energy. Well, the closed path integral of field, the closed path integral of field, I mean, in other words, closed integral of field times displacement, that is potential, electric potential. In other words, this left side, if you think it through and you look back at your notes from lab in particular, that left side is voltage. In other words, all the, and voltage, V equals IR, leads to current. In other words, and this was sort of an accident. I mean, there was reason for him to sort of expect sort of for this to work in special cases, but he did not expect that it would work in all cases or as a universal principle, i.e. a law. It, it, so I'm going to say it again now. I'm going to say it again. The right side looks like the derivative of an integral. It is. You might think, if you've been following the math of this course and your calculus, you might think for a minute, wait, derivative of an integral, isn't that just going in circles? I thought like integral is antiderivative, but no, I mean, good thing to think. If you're thinking that at all, you're a smart person and you're with me, but no, the variable of integration is space, is a little bit of area. The variable of differentiation is time. So what the right side is saying is that the total amount of flux, the adding up all the magnetic field through an area, if you add all that up, but you get flux, that's the integral. But then if you change that in time, then the left side of the equation occurs, okay? So it's not going in circles. We're saying if you, if you change the magnetic th field through an area, you're suddenly gonna get electricity, an electrical current, electrical circuit going around the perimeter of that area. Now, you know, this is called a generator. 
This is the idea that changing magnetic fields create electricity. This is where we get generators from. This is where we get power plants from. This was huge. This is the industrial revolution right here, this Faraday's law. Again, high school chemistry teacher who wasn't that great at mathematics, at, at computation, which is why he's the one who gives us this whole concept of, of field lines and flux, the whole concept of looking at field lines on a picture and counting the lines and calling it flux largely comes from Faraday because he actually wasn't that strong at, at abstract analytical mathematics, like many of us feel, many of us. So he came up with this whole field line flux thing, and then he did an experiment that showed if you change a magnetic flux through an area, if you change the magnetic flux through an area in time, you'll generate, generate, induce electric fields, electricity in the perimeter in the closed path bounding that area. That's a big, and that's how we can generate electricity without batteries. That's the industrial revolution. On a practical level, that's huge, huge. And it's late, you know, 1800s. But on an intellectual or a theoretical or an abstract level, it's also fascinating. Because let's stand back and look what I'm saying so far. I'm saying that a closed N dimensional region of space is the boundary to an N plus one region of space. And I'm saying charges cause electricity. Moving charges cause moving electricity or changing electricity. Let me say this again point charges create electricity, flows of charges create flowing electricity, which all flowing electric fields, which we ultimately call magnetic fields. Now, Faraday's saying something that's almost not even a surprise in a way, when you think about it this way, he's saying, yeah, and flowing magnetic fields, changing magnetic fields cause electricity because magnetic fields in the first place were just that, they were a flow in electrical fields. So now he's saying if you flow those, so to speak, if magnetic fields start changing what they're doing in um, time, they will create more fields. And the fields will wrap around or bound around the area that the magnetic fields were going through, just like the magnetic fields themselves wrapped around or looped around the area through which the electric charges were going through. Because again, remember what field lines are is the information of what's going on. And field lines are communicating to space what is going on, charges, the, 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 the location, the size, and the configuration, the activity of the charges. And the field lines are always as symmetric and simple as they can be. So when charges are like this, they create field lines like that. When charges are going like this, they create field lines like that. And when, the, when, these, when these field lines start changing or flowing, they create field lines around them like that. That's what Faraday's saying. In other words, let me give you a kind of primitive picture of this. I'm saying that if you create current, it creates magnetic field around it. But it... And if you just do that, if you just create a current and it's just steady current, like five amperes constant, then it'll create a magnetic field of a whole bunch of magnetic field lines looping around it. So if I create current like this, I'll create magnetic field lines doing essentially what my fingers are doing around the thumb of my current. But if the current's constant, then the magnetic field lines are constant. But but what Faraday's saying is, in a way, not surprisingly, what, if those magnetic field lines start changing, if they start, if, if, they st if their flux through any area that you imagine starts changing, either because the area changes or more likely because they change in strength, then they're going to cause a field line to go around them. I mean, again, nature has to know that this next thing happened. So if you have a current that isn't constant, but let's say, had is, I should write this. If you have a current that's like some constant times time, if it's like an algebraic 
if, if current is linearly proportional, directly proportional to time, so that it's getting stronger and stronger as time goes on, then, then its B field lines around it will create field lines around them, E field lines. But if that's it, then the process will stop right there. Like, in other words, if there's one rate of change of the current, if there's one derivative, go back to the original law, if there's one derivative, then that'll create electricity around the B field, that'll create an electric field line looping around the B field line. But if it, but if the, if you can only take one derivative, like of a linear function of a, uh, of a function that's T to the power of one, if you can only take one derivative, then you'll just get that one line. If you created a current that was not just changing in time, but accelerating in time, right? You get two derivatives. So this current would create a B field. The changing B field would create an, a changing E field. And then the changing E field would create a changing B field or a B field, and then it would stop. In other words, for each derivative that you have, look at the right side of this last equation. For each derivative that you generate, you get a new field looping around the old field perpendicular to it. If you have an al if current is an algebraic function of time, like I naught times T, or even one half I naught times T squared, or even one third I naught times T cubed. If it's, uh, if current is some function of time that's a finite number of powers of time, you'll get a finite number of derivatives and therefore a finite number of new induced or created field loops, right? I hope you're still with me. I, I'm almost afraid to check in, but I'm almost there, by the way, we're doing fine. We're, but what if you create current that is, for example, going back to the beginning of the year, the semester, what if you create cur current that is like, for example, a cosinusoidal function of time. It doesn't have to be cosine, it could be sine, it could be E, like it could be an exponential function of time. But what if you create some current that is flowing in a manner that is a function of time and that is infinitely di differentiable with regard to time? Current that's getting stronger and stronger and then weaker and weaker and then stronger and stronger and then weaker and weaker, for example, right? You remember from the beginning of the semester, the, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. The derivative of negative sine is negative cosine. The derivative of negative cosine is sine. And then the derivative of sine is back to cosine. We can take derivatives of certain functions like forever, which means that if we, again, remember a bit of charge over here creates information, raw information everywhere in space. A flow of, and, and this, information spreads out in space symmetrically, as symmetrically as the bit of charge is. A flow of charge creates information that loops around it as symmetrically as possible. It's a loop. Again, again why a loop? Because a dot of charge creates radiation, creates radial lines, creates flux, but a flow of charge is not a dot. A flow of charge is number one, one dimensional, it's a line, Number two, it has direction. It's like, I'm going to say again, a zero dimensional scalar point of charge creates the most symmetric, simple thing it possibly could, which is lines going, field lines going out forever, radiating. But a vector of charge, a one dimensional directional vector of charge, i.e. flow, i.e. current, creates the most simple symmetric field line picture it could create which is loops around it. Again, and again, I want to say, because there's 15 minutes more, that is the simplest. I mean, when you first hear, it's like, wait, where did these closed loops come from? Why are there closed? Why are magnetic field lines? I mean, it seems like something you just memorize. And maybe you've heard it before in eighth grade or something, but it's not just a memorizer. It's a concept. It's that space over here has to know that there's not just charge over here, but has to know there's a line of charge and has to know it's pointing in that direction. If, 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 we, if this line of charge created spokes coming out of it, like radiating spokes, space would know that there's something over there, but it wouldn't know what direction it was flowing in. 
the only way for something over here that is a vector, the most symmetric, simple way for a vector to create lines is for the lines to loop around the vector, right? And that's what we call magnetic field lines. Again, magnetic field lines are the field lines caused by flow. Electric field lines are the lines caused by points. But magnetic field lines, therefore, are themselves closed paths, right? And what I'm saying now is that according to both the logic of that and according to Faraday's law, if you start having those closed paths of magnetic field lines, if they start themselves flowing, if they're getting stronger and weaker or moving through it, if they start fluxing through an area at different rates, then they cause new things to loop around them. I mean, nature has to know that this next derivative has happened. The simplest way for the next derivative to be of charge per unit time, the simplest way for that next derivative to be communicated to space is in a next loop. So if I have a current that is oscillating cosinusoidally in time, that means the rate of change of the current, that means that the current is not constant. It means it has a rate of change. It has a derivative. It means that it's creating B field loops that have a derivative. So according to that last law and according to the logic, these B fields that have a derivative will cause E fields looping around, like every little line of B field, every little bit will create an E field going around it. It's called electromagnetic induction or generators. Every one of these E fields. Now, if the original source was cosinusoidal, every one of these derivatives has a derivative. Every one of these E field lines is not constant because you because you could take derivatives of cosine forever and never get a constant, right? So each one of these E field lines now is flowing. It's like its own little current in a way. Now it's it's it is its own little current of field rather than of charge. So it creates magnetic field line going around it. Right. And then that magnetic field line causes an E field line going around it. In fact, in fact, in 1870, okay, so you're following what I'm saying. I hope that this process can go on forever. In fact, in 1879, Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell, who's a Scottish physicist and a very advanced mathematician, looked at the left side of all of these models and saw how shockingly identical and patterned the left side, how symmetric all the left sides were of all of these laws and was a little surprised that the right sides were kind of messier and less symmetric than the left sides were. He noticed that the left sides, there were two laws about electrical field, two laws about magnetic field, and there's two laws about closed surface areas and two laws about closed paths. It's all so tidy, but the right side seems a little messy. He basically invented vector calculus to multi um, um, variable calculus. So we could rewrite all these laws in a different form, in a differential form, and did all this really intense, awesome math that I'd love to do with any of you someday if you're ever interested. And he realized that in fact, he just put into mathematical terms what I'm trying to say in English, which is that he realized that the third law, Ampere's law, was actually under very specific conditions when things were moving fast enough faster than anybody had noticed in the lab, he noticed that there was actually another term. Yeah. He noticed that there was another term, just like the term in the fourth law, that what I'm saying now, that when E field, when E flux through a, a closed area, sorry, when E flux through an open area changes in time, it produces a magnetic field around the closed path bounding that area. But I was just saying in English, but he noticed that it actually had to be true, that the right sides had to be matched up in effect, just like the left sides. That just, so if you follow any one of these equations, the equations are mirrors of each other in a way. And I'm saying in the end, that if you change magnetic flux through an area in time, you get electric field in the perimeter of that area. If you change electric fields through an area in time, you get magnetic fields 
uh, closing around that area. It almost has to be the case because magnetic field lines just are fluxing electric field lines. But Maxwell showed that mathematically and showed that Ampere's law was missing a turn. Remember also, and I'm, I'm watching the clock, we're almost there. Remember also that epsilon naught is just the constant like big G that is a proportionality constant that allows us to work out electric field strength in metric units, newtons per coulomb. And, mag and the other constant that's new to you, this mu naught is, is a constant for magnetism. And it just allows the units to work out so that we get magnetic field in proper units, okay? So Maxwell was the one that took these four equations, these seemingly two from Gauss, one from Ampere, one from Faraday's law, one from Faraday. He looked at them enough, enough, and reanalyzed them mathematically and was like, I'm actually going to correct Ampere's law and I'm going to add a term so that to make it more universal and correct. And Maxwell realized, okay, changing magnetic fields make electric fields, changing electric fields make magnetic fields. There is a negative sign on the fourth equation. There is not any negative sign in the third equation. So Maxwell did realize that when magnetic fields are changing this way, they cause electric field lines in one direction. But then when the electric field lines are changing, they create magnetic field lines in another direction. Like there's a negative sign on one equation, not on the other. So that you get a picture like what I was showing you before. If you create fields that are oscillating cosinusoidally in time, you get field making field, but then you make, you get field, you get current making field, which is changing, making field, which is changing, making field, which is changing, making field, which is changing. And you keep getting these interlocking loops of field lines that sort of march like up, right, up, right, up, right. Like, like they don't loop around themselves because one has a negative sign and the other doesn't. So the field lines keep making these, so to speak, these nested clothes, these interlocking chain links of closed paths. Now these are just lines of field, right? I mean, this, this is just like a bunch of vectors in space. They're just information in space, but the way they're arranging themselves in an infinitely differential in an infinitely differentiable source of fields, the way they'll start arranging themselves is in these interlocking rings. And the thing is that the rings have to go somewhere. They don't double back on themselves because one equation has a negative sign and one doesn't. So the interlocking rings will move away, <clears throat> march away, so to speak, from that current. They'll start moving off into space, at least that pattern will move off into space away from the thing that originally created them. Now, field lines are already everywhere in space, but this pattern of field lines will start moving out into space away from the current that created them. And you might see where this is going if they're all created by something cosinusoidal like that, and if they're locking into each other and creating a pattern of patterns in space and time, then what you might already be realizing in English in your mind is what Maxwell showed mathematically by taking these four equations, noticing that in these four equations, it's two equations for electric field, it's two for magnetic field, there goes my board again, but they're each interdependent on each other, right? One of the equations for magnetic field depends on the change in electric field. And one of the equations for electric field depends on the change in magnetic field. He developed enough math himself to be able to decouple the equations and rewrite them so that electric field information was written only in terms of itself and that he decoupled. And, and when he decoupled the equation with, math, with vector calculus that he basically invented for the purpose, Maxwell decoupled, he found that they, he, he derived equations for the electric and magnetic the electric and magnetic field, which totally captured in mathematics what you might already be thinking in English, which is the following. And and I do see the time, and we're like perfect. You've been very very attentive. And again, when we're done, we're done. Here we go.
and then just contact me with any questions personally. What he found is that these interlocking rings that cause each other, this ripple that way, and then that ripple that way, and then that ripple that way, and that ripple, and they fly away from the original, they run out of room. So they seem to actually, these field lines, which are just information, seem to move away from the original source, the flow that caused them in the first place. When he rearranged the mathematics, he found that the electric field line, the electric field lines, for example, fell into this equation, which you might remember from the first page of today's lecture. And you might remember from the earlier days of the semester, he found that the electric field line satisfies or can be rearranged in the wave equation. He found that the second derivative of electric field strength with respect to time equals a constant times the second derivative of electric field with respect to space. I don't even care about the vector symbols if that's, it will, I do care about that. If the vector symbols are confusing, you don't even worry about them. I'm say, but I'm saying on each dimension of space, the electric field, once he decoupled those field equations, he found that on each dimension of space, the X dimension, the Y dimension, the Z dimension, the electric field satisfied or could be written as the wave equation. In other words, the electric field lines propagate away from the source that created them. And the same thing is true on the Y dimension and on the Z dimension, and the same thing is true for the magnetic fields. Then in other words, if you create a current that is oscillating cosinusoidally or infinitely differentially in time, you create waves which perpetually create, new, I'm sorry, you create fields which perpetually create and induce new fields, which create new fields, which create new fields. And the interlocking system of field rings propagates out in the manner of a wave and satisfies the wave equation. So the fields wave out, they propagate out from the current. And, and that's already wild because who knew that fields could do that? Fields are already everywhere in space. Fields are just like vectors or whatever, or lines everywhere in space. Now, apparently fields, electric and magnetic locking fields can propagate out in space as long as they're arranged properly. And they propagate out at, according to the wave equation at a speed, which is the square root of the constant of proportionality, one over the square root of mu naught epsilon naught. That was already wild enough to Maxwell, but then Maxwell ran the numbers. And, and you can do this if you want right now in the one minute and a half left that we have of class. If you type into the calculator, epsilon naught, which is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, it's just an arbitrary constant, but that's universal. That just makes the units work out for electricity. And then you multiply that by mu naught, which is 1.26 times 10 to the negative six. You multiply them two together, these two seemingly arbitrary, not worth memorizing, weird, obscure numbers, one for electricity, one for magnetism. You take the square root of that and you put it under one and you might, I'm sure you're guessing where this is going. It turns out that what you get is the speed of light. And that's what Maxwell got. And Maxwell didn't see that coming at all. And neither did I, and maybe you did. But Maxwell realized, oh my God, when electric fields and magnetic fields perpetually reinduce each other, they propagate out through space in the manner of a wave and they propagate at the speed of light. What light is, is raw information propagating in the manner of a wave and there's 30 seconds left. So let me reinforce just how, you might have heard that in seventh grade, but now I'm telling you what it means. To say that light is an electromagnetic wave, remember that a wave is an unthingy thing. A wave is raw information propagating that, that we only believe in or can understand because a bunch of thingy things oscillate in the first place called a medium to allow raw information to propagate through the material particles. But here, what we're saying is light is raw information propagating through a medium of raw information, the very medium that is oscillating and wiggling and vibrating back and forth, the medium that is vibrating to allow this unthingy information to fly through it at the speed that we know to be the speed of light, the medium that allows this propagation, the medium itself is already just 
raw information. It's just vectors and lines in space representing numbers. So what light is, is raw information propagating through a medium of raw information. Light speed is the rate at which one point in space over here updates another point in space over here of any change that has occurred. Speed of light is the speed at which the universe talks to itself. That's what light is. And that's the point of physics. So goodbye. Have a great night. Text somebody with any questions or whatever. You've been a wonderful class. I'll hang out for, yes, have a great day. Have a great, I'll hang out for have a second. Day. Have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Yabberbaum, for teaching. I will miss you and I hope you have a great summer. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you very much. I really will miss you guys. And I hope to stay in touch. You got, and I'm going to turn off the record, but thank you. And I hope this no all I'll, I'll definitely try to stay in touch. I'll definitely try. Please do. Please do. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Yes, I'm going to turn off the recording.